Let me please get your attention. We're going to start the afternoon workshop focused on cannabis and elderly people, harm reduction, hospice, and palliative care. As uh, has been already addressed, uh, I believe, uh, multiple times during uh, International Cannabis Policy Conference, uh, the endocannabinoid uh, system, uh, how to say the proper English term, uh, the, the, the scaling through the human body is so pervasive that uh, uh, we are still learning in uh, uh, the medical practice uh, how the various uh, uh, parts which are plugged in uh, can be used to modulate the, the various disharmonizations of uh, homeostasis which uh, are in fact now causing the so-called burden of disease so uh, they do represent the, um, most of the uh, cost spends on providing health care in countries where health care systems are implemented. To uh, understand how uh, complex it is, we have to also take into account that uh, uh, endocannabinoid system does not uh, interact only on the macroscopic level, but, uh, or sorry, on the extracellular level, but also goes uh, into the intracellular space uh, where uh, we are against uh, uh, just at the very beginning of understanding this complex synergies which the various compounds which are represented uh, within the uh, bioactive complex uh, of the molecules produced by cannabis plant uh, can influence uh, various, uh, uh, various uh, bioactivities in a human body and how it can help to uh, treat some chronic diseases or at least uh, uh, bring the relief from suffering. Uh, this is uh, an example uh, which uh, uh, can uh, give uh, also uh, better understanding uh, why uh, the uh, healthcare systems are slow in adopting any innovations. It's uh, not uh, primarily because uh, uh, there's some strong pushback from implementing uh, potentially beneficial therapies, uh, but uh, there are always very good reasons why any uh, tests on humans, even with uh, otherwise uh, very safe uh, compounds, uh, takes time before they are fully scaled and accepted in a practice. Uh, this is a timeline uh, example of uh, how long it took to that simple fact that uh, uh, treatment of uh, stomach ulcer has been in uh, uh, 1982 proven that the primary cause is infection. So till that time it was uh, understood that this is kind of uh, uh, lifestyle related uh, disease that it caused by a lot of stress, a lot of caffeine and otherwise unhealthy diet. Uh, and the treatments provided uh, were, either, were either conservative, uh, improving the, or, or enabling the lifestyle change, what we know also since that time that it's uh, one of the most difficult uh, things to manage in the uh, compliance with patient. Uh, and uh, after this finding, uh, there was a pretty simple and logic solution starting to treat the infection, which uh, in fact the science was not able to uh, diagnose uh, before that time. Uh, and uh, once the infection was treated, of course, the ulcer start, the, the body started healing itself because the primary cause of the pathology was solved, so even people not changing their lifestyles were, uh, were getting great outcomes. Anyway, it took 15 years to get it scale into the practice. Uh, if we translate it to cannabis, we are still somewhere in, let's say, first third of this period. Uh, and as we will, uh, or as I will be addressing further, uh, if we take into account uh, how many various uh, potential treatment benefits are now being communicated, and not just with the medical cannabis, but also with various uh, non-medical cannabis products like foods and cosmetic. So th this is still a portion. 
But uh, if we put on it the filter of uh, evidence-based medicine uh, facts, which uh, uh, are really showing the therapeutical uh, effect in the given indication, in fact, so far, uh, sufficient, uh, sufficient evidence we have just for these four uh, ballets, so adult chronic pain treatment, multiple sclerosis spasticity, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and for CBD-based products, treatment of intractable seizures uh, of uh, uh, gastat lennox eindr uh, dravet syndrome. Which uh, already, I would say, uh, n n uh, brings uh, another evidence of the kind of uh, miscommunication between the uh, cannabis industry or cannabis uh, environment and all of us who are supporting this plant to be, uh, to be brought back to its uh, original uses uh, towards the, let's say, silent majority. Uh, if uh, a physician who's not interested in that topic and, and have it just as another uh, potential uh, innovation, which uh, of course, you know, all healthcare professionals are obliged to run their CMEs, uh, continuing medical education, so they need to study and prove that they are studying. Uh, so it, it's one of the many options where uh, if uh, the professional looks into the uh, relevant and reliable data for the given indications, uh, he's quite often seeing like totally different picture than what's being quite uh, what's being painted out uh, online, and also what are now a lot of patients' expectancies. Uh, what uh, we have already uh, uh, very promising uh, effects are those uh, shown to. Uh, deal with the chronic pain uh, and the epidemic of uh, opioid misuse. Uh, the data coming from Healer, from observatory study, but on uh, big enough patient numbers uh, are showing really uh, interesting improvements in quality of life, what's potentially, uh, especially in palliative care, more important than to be looking for some treatment benefits, because in palliative care, in fact, we are dealing mostly to help people not suffering and help them to have uh, the highest quality of life uh, possible uh, till their uh, pass away uh, nat uh, naturally. Uh, also, improved functions and reduced pain by 40% are really remarkable uh, data, but uh, at the same time, uh, despite cannabis uh, and cannabis-based uh, medications are having totally unique profiles, uh, unique safety profiles, uh, they still have risks because, uh, and, and as, as you can see, of course, the psychoactivity uh, induces various uh, psychiatric uh, disorders are belong to uh, the second uh, most uh, uh, observable uh, side effects uh, which uh, cannabis intake is bringing, uh, which again is... Uh, uh, fact which needs to be managed in clinical practice uh, if uh, the medication should be really scaled up to uh, let's call them cannabis naive patients and especially elderly patients of course will have uh, different reaction than what we are seeing normally with healthy individuals uh, uh, or so. Uh, and uh, if we go uh, even uh, into more detailed uh, picture how the evidence supports the use in palliative uh, care medicine, uh, there has been just recently published systematic review uh, and meta-analysis of cannabinoids in palliative care, which uh, team uh, led by Dr. Mecke uh, created. You can see it uh, also, the full text is available online. And uh, when... Uh, uh, you go through all those various uh, indications uh, which were meta-analyzed, so studies uh, realized with placebo uh, controlled uh, in the given indications were summarized and their results were pointed together. In fact, just the pain reduction for cancer patients in palliative care proved the significant uh, difference uh, against the placebo controlled. And uh, here we are getting to yet another potentially trade-off of, of uh, uh, making all those uh, bold claims uh, to the general publics where cannabis uh, can help. That, of course, patients are then having much higher expectation that they are finally reaching out to this kind of 
miracle treatment, how it's being quite often presented. And as, of course, uh, uh, those involved in the clinical setting knows that, unfortunately, nothing like that exists. Uh, despite cannabis is having really broad indication spectrum and is helping uh, in uh, uh, various states of disease and various types of patients uh, in situation uh, where otherwise the prognosis was uh, very negative. Uh, but still, uh, to, there is, uh, there is simple rationale going to the ethics of medicine, why all the treatment indications or even the pain or other suffering related indications needs to be tested towards placebo because if we found that the placebo is same statistically effective as they are the potential new treatment, whatever it is, it does not make sense to be implementing these in the given indications because they will not help the patients more than, the, uh, than their belief and uh, their natural body healing uh, activities. But at the same time, we already have those tools to be really dealing with uh, placebo in uh, the clinical setting and uh, with, the, with all the needs for personalization or individualization. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is not anymore a sci-fi. It's already uh, operating in Maccabi Healthcare, where, in fact, all the uh, data around patient care about his individual different reaction for various treatments he's receiving uh, are integrated digitally, providing, providing the healthcare professional the kind of proper background to be really uh, finding for the optimal type of treatment uh, for the given patient uh, because uh, the dosing of uh, medical cannabis uh, is uh, from the uh, clinical um, empirical uh, experience uh, already uh, showing clearly that uh, simply needs much uh, uh, broader interval of uh, looking for the proper uh, uh, personally effective dose. There is no doubt that uh, medical cannabis market in uh, Europe uh, uh, will uh, uh, be the um, one of the largest one uh, uh, globally because Europe is the aging or the fastest aging uh, continent uh, and uh, also Europe is having the purchase power to be uh, to be involving uh, innovative ways of uh, treatment especially of chronic disease where obviously chronic pain is one of the most uh, uh, obvious symptom uh, and uh, just the record level of investment uh, done in last uh, 12 months in new cultivation facilities which are opening across Europe can be taken as another evidence how the European markets uh, are getting important due to the aging society mostly. But uh, there are also um, special uh, risks involved with uh, bringing and not just medical cannabis products because they are especially in Europe very well controlled uh, uh, and uh, the risk of some uh, unknown uh, or non well tested contamination uh, is pretty low but at the same time we have to take in account that uh, a lot of uh, European patients or a lot of European citizens are already using the non-medical cannabis uh, products like various uh, food supplements, uh, food and cosmetics. And uh, due to the fact that cannabis resin is the defense layer and the bioaccumulative feature of the plant, uh, we are uh, quite often seeing that uh, even kind of organic certifications, which anyway works for uh, other crops being planted on those fields, are not preventing uh, uh, cannabis to be getting contaminated by, for example, two decades non-use pesticides, which are still somewhere in the environment, and cannabis is able to concentrate these in, in its resin. So there needs to be... Uh, Proper quality control enrolled. Uh, ICCI is monitoring already from 2016 how looks the quality of CBD oils on European markets. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, uh, it's problematic. Uh, simply said, uh, even in 2016, uh, where there was let's say the higher onset of products which were over limit, uh, 
uh, and some of them were really uh, substantially over limit, not just few milligrams, but as you can see, two times more. Uh, in, two, uh, in two 17 and 18, when we were purchasing the next batch of tested products, uh, it's the lower number from all the products tested, which was uh, 35, but uh, still nearly one five uh, or uh, one fifth of the products are contaminated by these poloaromatic hydrocarbons, which are cancerogenes of the 2A class. Uh, and uh, uh, so in fact, uh, a lot of uh, European consumers uh, are getting products which even do not fit the uh, basic safety requirements for the given product category and increasing their intake of cancerogenes. Uh, what's uh, getting the uh, uh, finding of proper form and, and uh, effective uh, uh, therapeutic model for a given patient uh, potentially more complicated uh, are uh, these findings where in fact, these three different uh, forms of medical cannabis dispensed in Czech pharmacies uh, are being by FDA accepted as the same medication, just in different form, either enterosolvent capsules or a cream uh, for topical use. And the first one, as you probably recognize, is the herbal material. But as you can see from the metabolom uh, uh, fingerprint profiling, the profile of bioactive compounds is different even by the easy look. The peaks are different. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, are even capturing that uh, if the um, so-called decarboxylation by heat is applied, uh, the THC total, which is the level of active compound being tracked by FDA, uh, is lowering by 14% but still being used as the, uh, or, or being labeled as uh, having the same concentration uh, of the, as the herbal material. So uh, there's also a clear uh, call to the regulatory authorities to be uh, developing uh, new ways how to distinguish between various uh, medical cannabis medications to get proper understanding to clinical professionals what type for what patients can do the best service. And uh, last but not least, just briefly on ICCI, uh, that's in fact why uh, International Cannabis and Cannabinoids Institute uh, start providing this various range of services, going through uh, various uh, consultings, uh, but also bringing contract research organization specializing on designing clinical trials, working with uh, the whole plant materials. Uh, and uh, also uh, we are implementing this patient focused certification across the non-medical uh, products quality management uh, in Europe and globally. And uh, that's what enabled us to uh, propose the, the palliative care uh, project with cannabis, which we submitted to Horizon 2020 to the call on palliative care. Uh, it was not supported by budget uh, because there's 3% uh, uh, probability that the first submission uh, gets financed. But uh, even European Commission recognized on the evaluation feedback uh, highly that uh, uh, cannabis uh, treatments development for uh, palliative care uh, is being proposed. But uh, it uh, helped us to shape uh, uh, truly international and uh, clinically uh, and also theoretically well-equipped network, which is in fact now progressing to uh, finding uh, different funding resources uh, to move further, uh, complementing, uh, complementing all, the, all the goals of the Horizon 2020 projects as they have been set up. So thanks for your attention, for the introduction to the topic, how we can progress with medical cannabis in palliative care. And now give me a floor to fill it. Just gonna load up my presentation if we can figure this out. No problem.
that'll, uh, I think that'll do us for, uh, for the time being. Hello? Take that one, mate. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. I like to wander around while I'm talking, so I'm going to take a handheld mic if you guys don't mind. So my name is Philippe Lucas. I'm uh, Vice President of Global Patient Research and Access at Tilray. Um, I've been working on medical cannabis for over 20 years now. I started out as a patient uh, when I got diagnosed with hepatitis C in 1999, which I'd gotten through tainted blood in Canada when I was 12 years old. Um, at the time, I had trouble finding a safe, consistent source of cannabis, but I was finding it useful in treating some of the symptoms of hepatitis C, the inflamed uh, liver that, I, that came with it, the nausea, and some of the appetite-stimulating effects. And I, I was 25 at the time and going to university, and I thought, if a 25-year-old university student can't find a safe source of cannabis, how's a 65-year-old woman with cancer, how's she going to find a consistent, safe source of cannabis? So in 1999, I opened up the Vancouver Island Compassion Society, which was a nonprofit medical cannabis dispensary. I ran that for about 10 years, and I, uh, uh, that's when I started doing medical cannabis research because I would talk to physicians, and I would talk to elected officials, and they would say, you know, there's not enough evidence on medical cannabis. And I say, are you doing the research? It's like, no, we're not doing the research. Well, if no one's doing the research, we're, ne we're never going to build up the evidence. So I started gathering data because every day when I would go to work at the dispensary, patients would want to share their stories. And one of the privileges of doing research with cannabis patients is that they really want to share their stories. I think many patients feel that they've been dispossessed from the traditional healthcare system, and they want to talk about how medical cannabis has changed their lives. So I simply started gathering data, and I went back and I did a master's. Now I'm finishing up a PhD uh, to continue my work and research on medical cannabis. I started working at Tilray about five years ago in my role as Global Patient Research and Access, uh, as VP Global Patient Research and Access. I oversee our observational uh, patient strategy. I oversee some of our clinical research strategy, and the patient services department reports up to me as well. It's been a real privilege working with the team at Tilray. Uh, I want to start out by just telling you a little bit about Tilray. You guys would have seen this slide if you were here this morning. Uh, Tilray is based out of uh, uh, British Columbia, Canada. We have production facilities in Nanaimo, BC. That was the first GMP-certified medical cannabis production facility in North America. We also have a 100-acre farm in Ontario where we grow in greenhouse, and uh, we're going to be doing uh, down-the-road outdoor cultivation as well. We have a, a, a high-tech production facility in uh, uh, Cantanied, Portugal as well, which services uh, is going to be servicing all of the European Union as well, because our products right now are available in 12 countries on five continents. Uh, ironically, most of those countries, including Germany and, and Chile and uh, Czech Republic, our products are available through the pharmacy system, but in Canada, medical cannabis is still not available through pharmacies. We have to ship cannabis products, medical cannabis products, to patients uh, across the country. So uh, we were, uh, were really a country of first, uh, or a company of first. We were the first to export in Australia, New Zealand, first to export to South and Central America, and, and uh, first to export into the European Union as well. Um, we are involved in a number of clinical trials. I'm going to go through them in a bit more detail uh, today than I, or than I did this morning. We have a study of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. That's a, uh, a relationship with the government in New South Wales and the University of Sydney. We're looking at a 2.5 milligram THC, 2.5 milligram CBD capsule that patients take uh, an hour before going into cancer chemotherapy. The idea is to deal not just with the nausea from chemotherapy, but also the anticipatory nausea, which is one of the psychological phenomena that happens when people go through uh, chemotherapy. We uh, finished a study of pediatric epilepsy and Dravet syndrome uh, with SickKids Hospital. That's the top, the premier children's hospital in Canada that was using the highest CBD product available in Canada. It's 100 milligrams per milliliter of CBD and 2 milligrams per milliliter of THC. And we had remarkable uh, impacts on seizure disorder uh, at that study. We've got a phase two clinical trial on post-traumatic stress disorder. It's been going on for about 18 months right now at the University of British Columbia, and we're launching a second site for that study in downtown Vancouver in the coming weeks. We finished a study of COPD at McGill University, and most recently we got approval for a study of essential tremors at the University of California, San Diego. It's going to be the first time that a company has permission to export a cannabis product into uh, uh, the U.S. 
US uh, uh, to be able to do clinical research there. And we've got so much interest now from US researchers looking for a better source of, of uh, research grade material uh, because right now in the US they're very limited as to what they can use. It's the University of Mississippi product and it's a very limited uh, uh, scope, the amount of THC, et cetera, they don't make extracts. So US researchers are hungry right now to do research and looking for new products to be able to do research with. And we also uh, have been involved in a cannabis and driving study at the uh, uh, taking place at the University of Sydney. The results of that study are actually going to be published in the next few weeks, so we'll look forward to sharing that with you down the road as well. We're also interested in looking at um, how cannabis can uh, impact uh, cancer glioblastoma, HIV AIDS, anxiety and alcoholism, and in the coming months we'll be announcing studies in those areas as well. So, as a medical cannabis researcher, I'm also the primary investigator in these four studies right now. Um, the uh, Tilray Patient Survey is the largest survey of Canadian patients conducted to date with 200 or 2,032 patients. That study has actually resulted in four publications. One of them is out, three others are under review right now. But the main focus of the publications are looking at cannabis and the impact on anxiety, but also the impact on opioid use tobacco use, and on uh, headaches and migraines. Uh, the headaches and migraines paper is already out. That was done with Cleveland Clinic and Eric Barron. Um, I'm, I'm also on, in charge of the Tilray Observational Patient Survey uh, Study, which is the largest longitudinal tracking of medical cannabis patients to date at 2,100 patients at 21 different medical sites. And at uh, I think it's at 720, we're doing a panel on opioid uh, uh, cannabis and the impact on opioids. If you have a chance to attend that, I'm going to be sharing all the preliminary results from the top study there as well, which really uh, shows dramatic reductions in opioid use in patients who use medical cannabis. Um, in, in that same vein, I've also started the substitution of opioid study looking at cannabis and its impact on methadone suboxone treatment to see if the use of medical cannabis can improve the success rate of those with opioid use disorder. And just to be clear, when patients start doing methadone or suboxone, when they have an opioid use disorder that bad, if they fail out of that treatment, they go back into a contaminated uh, drug stream, they've lost their tolerance, that's when they are at the biggest risk of overdose. So if you can increase the success rate of methadone or suboxone, you can actually save lives. Lives. Uh, and on top of that, and the reason that I'm you know, on this panel today, I think, is um, I recently launched, just last week, the Medical Cannabis and Older Patient Study, which is a longitudinal tracking of medical cannabis patients over 50, and we're really excited to get this study going. It's got to be a multi-site examination. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about it as well. So why are we studying medical cannabis in older patients? Well, older patients are amongst the fastest rising groups of medical cannabis uh, patients in Canada and around the world. There's no doubt that this baby boomer generation that grew up having tried cannabis in their youth are more open to considering medical cannabis as they're getting older. They haven't bought into the 70 years of drug war propaganda that we've all been exposed to, and at least they're open to it because of previous experiences with this, uh, with this product. Very little is known about how older Canadians or older patients are using cannabis and its impact on their health and well-being. But there's good reasons to think that older patients may be using medical cannabis differently and, uh, and be subject to different risks and benefits than younger users. So let me give you an example of that. I find that patients over 60 don't tolerate smoking or vaporization very well for the most part. So there's good reasons for that. And, and, and let me share you another anecdote. My mother, who uses cannabis occasionally for arthritis, <clears throat> doesn't like to smoke it. And she says, that stuff is so much stronger than when I was younger. The stuff you guys smoke is so much stronger. She's not entirely wrong in that certainly potencies have increased somewhat, you know, from the 60s or 70s to now. But the reality is it's not just the cannabis that's stronger. As we get older, we become more sensitized to cannabinoid medications. So what would be, you know, a normal amount of cannabis or a normal dose for an 18 or a 25-year-old may be a very high dose for someone that's older as well. Now, that's not just with cannabis. 
what, you know, when you're 75, you don't drink beer or wine at the same rate that you did when you were 25. You don't take the same rate of pharmaceutical products as you might have when you were 25 either. So there's reasons biologically why seniors, why older patients might respond to medical cannabis differently than a younger population. And of course, when you're older and you're using cannabis, you, the last thing that you want to have to worry about is dizziness and disorientation that could cause a fall. Because if you have grandparents, you'll know their worst fear is to have a fall and break a hip. And it's not because of the broken hip. It's because that can lead to a hospitalization and an operation which they may not survive ultimately. Because as you're older, going under a full anesthetic becomes more and more dangerous. So there's all kinds of reasons why older patients may not use cannabis the same way as younger patients, and why they might prefer oral ingestion, which has a slower onset of effect, but a very slow, flat line in terms of blood plasma levels, compared to smoking or vaporization, where you get this high blood plasma level for the first five minutes that winds down for the next two hours. So that's one of the reasons we want to study this, we want to find out how seniors are using medical cannabis and how successful it is in dealing with the conditions of aging. And there's another reason that seniors are so interested in this, because I have to say, I'm, I'm so privileged and honored and grateful to be able to share my research around the world. But the biggest number of groups that ask me to present these days are older groups, the retirement groups, probus clubs, rotary clubs in North America. I get an invite at least once a month to come in front of rooms full of seniors, and they always say the same thing. They say, oh my god, the turnout. I've, we haven't seen this kind of turnout in so long. People must really care about medical cannabis. And they do. And they say, oh, we haven't seen Steve in two years. We weren't even sure that Steve was still alive. And so they're very excited about the turnout. And they always say this too, we made brownies for the break. <laughs> so it's very cute. It's adorable. And I tell them all the time that... I've been working on medical cannabis for 20 years, and I've had a chance to present in front of our House of Commons and the Senate and our courts, but I do it all to get in front of a room full of seniors. Because when I started this 20 years ago, I never would have had the opportunity to present to a room full of over 60 you know, retirees. They wouldn't have even listened to it at the time. But now they're so curious because they're so tired of the poly drug approach to aging. They get given a pill and then two pills for the side effects effects of that pill. And they're just not seeing the benefits anymore. They're seeing the impacts on their stomachs and the lining of their stomachs. They're seeing the negative impacts on their liver, but they're not seeing the impacts that they're seeing otherwise. And of course, cannabinoids, as Pavel shared, have many anti-aging properties. As agents of homeostasis, they can help regulate and flatten out some of the conditions associated with aging, such as autoimmune condition, because cannabinoids are powerful immunoregulators, so an immunomodulants. And if you have a condition like arthritis, it's really an immune condition response that you need to tone. And, and so that's one of the reasons I think that seniors are responding so well and are growing so fast. And another reason that so many seniors are using medical cannabis now is that when you and I saw each other this morning, the first discussion that we had was not about our health. But if you're over 65 and you see your friend, one of the first questions you're going to have is, how are you doing today? How's that new treatment? How's that new medication? And if you have a medication that works and you're an older patient, you want to tell everyone in the room about it. So when I do these presentations to seniors, there's always a few people who out themselves. They say, I've been using cannabis oil for five years and it works great. And they talk about it and they tell the other seniors about it. So I think that's one of the reasons that more and more seniors and older patients are considering this because they talk, their health is their primary concern going in aging and they wanna talk about what works for them. So I think that ultimately, a better understanding of how older patients use medical cannabis could inform age-specific treatment options and uh, of course, Tilray's product development as well. So the study that we've started is called the Medical Cannabis and Older Patients Study. It's a multi-site study uh, that's going to take place in five to ten different sites, and we're hoping to recruit 100 patients per site. The co-investigator is Dr. Blake Pearson. He's a physician in uh, Sarnia, Ontario. He has tremendous experience in wor working with older patients, including in long-term care facilities. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but cannabis is increasingly used in long-term care facilities, not just for the standard diseases of aging, but also for dementia and Alzheimer's. Because patients can be very disruptive, you know, against their consciousness. They don't know they're doing this when they have Alzheimer's or, or de dementia. And the standard treatment for that is benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are addictive. 
They are very narcotic, and they lead to memory loss, which doesn't help when you already have dementia or Alzheimer's. So cannabis can be a much safer, better alternative uh, to just high uh, to, to benzodiazepine when it comes to treating the diseases of aging, so, and particularly with Alzheimer's or dementia. So the goal is to examine the impact of medical cannabis on pain, on sleep, on quality of life, on healthcare utility, and on prescription drug use in older patients. And we're going to be doing all of the recruitment in the different medical clinics where we're working or the long-term care facilities where the study is being administered. So Tilray is not doing any of the data gathering. All the data gathering is being done on an iPad using RedCap, which is an online HIPAA, PIPAA-compliant data gathering service. And... Um, we hope to have about 1,000 patients ultimately in this study. And the instruments that we're using are a demographic survey where we want to know the age, you know, they have some of the background of the patients. The cannabis use survey, which tracks their cannabis use to a very fine degree, what kind of cannabis they're using, what kind of cannabis extract they're using. If they're using more than one extract, one for daytime, one for nighttime, we want to track that. How many milligrams a day of THC and CBD they're ingesting through their extracts. So a very detailed cannabis use survey. We're using the brief pain inventory, which is a standard instrument to use to track chronic pain so we can look at the impact on pain scores. We're using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which is the most validated sleep quality uh, survey out there. And we're using something called the Equal Five Dimensions uh, uh, Questionnaire. And this is a really interesting quality of life instrument because it includes an econometric uh, analysis of it. So it, it basically takes a quality of life measure and it looks at how that impacts healthcare utility because ultimately if we want our governments and our insurers to cover the cost of cannabis, we need to show that there's a cost savings associated with cannabis. And I think that what we see typically with patients is not only a reduction in prescription drug use, but fewer ER visits, fewer doctor's visits, and a lot of cost savings. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, that Germany opted to cover the cost of medical cannabis because there might be some cost savings down the road uh, associated with medical cannabis use. So the study launched in uh, December of 2018. It's going to end December 2019, so it's a very quick study, and we're going to track the impact of medical cannabis for six months on these patients with data gathering at baseline, at two and three months, and then at six months. So we'll look at the impact it has on quality of life, pain, sleep, and prescription drug use over that period of time. And the results from, MCOP, from the MCOP study may help identify how older patients are using medical cannabis in terms of patterns of use and product-specific outcomes. It can help assess the impact of medical cannabis on pain, on sleep, on quality of life, as well as healthcare utility. And hopefully, it'll be useful to inform future treatment options and guidelines for older patients. I just want to take one minute to talk about palliative care because this is quite different. When we talk about older patients... Not all of them are dying, so I want to be clear about that. Some of them are going to live long and healthy lives still, and so I want to separate the studies we're doing with older patients with palliative care. So medical cannabis is often used in palliative care settings in Canada. In fact, when I started this work in 1999 and 2000, even before we had a medical cannabis program in Canada, palliative care uh, uh, organizations were the first ones to reach out and to say, we want to work with you on regulations about how patients can use this medical cannabis on our facilities. And so palliative care facilities are at the forefront of understanding that cannabis can improve quality of life in end-of-life care. I'm fortunate in that over the last 20 years of working with patients, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of patients in end-of-life settings. And the one thing that you note know about medical cannabis when you're working with someone in end-of-life care is that it's not only helpful to that patient, <clears throat> it's also incredibly helpful to the family members of that patient. Because unlike opioids that can be very disassociative um, and that can lead to multiple side effects, medical cannabis, when used properly, can allow the patient to have continuing relations with those around them. They're not out of it all day. They're not unconscious all day. And that leads to much better outcomes. So the, those last few weeks, those last few months with a loved one can be much more satisfactory than just walk, watching them sleep away all day on a bed. 
So medical cannabis can help with pain, with sleep, and with mental health challenges associated with end of life. And that overall can improve the quality of life of patients in end of life care. Medical cannabis can also reduce the opioids, the use of opioids and other prescription medications, therefore reducing disassociation. And reducing impairment, drowsiness, and disassociation in the end of life can improve outcomes for both patients and family members. So that's what I wanted to share today. We now, Pavel and I, wanted to open it up for discussion and see if there are any questions about the medical use of cannabis in older populations or in, or in palliative care. So hopefully, ah, are you going to run the mic? I- Fantastic. For, we're so lucky to have such great volunteers here. Thank you, Fat. Thank you, Fat. <laughs> So, Pavel, do you want to come up and we'll take some questions? If there are any on this? Yeah. Hi. Uh, first, I would like to have some... Uh, uh, so, my great, uh, great uh, appreciation to bring, to bring here, this is a mostly uh, important topic for uh, using of uh, cannabis for elderly population and... Uh, and uh, for palliative care, because I suppose it's most uh, most important topic and the most important area to utilize abilities and properties of cannabis for various uh, form for this kind of patients. My first, uh, I have two first remarks. First, first is uh, for uh, talk of Pavel, saying that uh, Maccabi um, health healthcare system in Israel, they continuously hide the data. Uh, they showed to our parliament committee, you know, as a, I am a parliament or Israel parliament advisor for cannabis regulation, and we invited them to provide their da- data about a huge reducing of the cost for their patients. They made it for two years from uh, 20, uh, 2010 to 2012. They had this research, and when we w- would like to uh, explicitly to our parliament committee, they just said, so we uh, lost the data. So, and they h- hided the data, showed that the, the huge reduction of the cost for the overall treating of the patients while they were prescribed with cannabis. So please don't explicitly say it's like, because Maccabi is a, now is under huge criticism because of the uh, artificial hiding uh, of the data showing that cannabis just save public money for healthcare. Uh, this is first, and uh, also I would like to appreciate this Horizon uh, initiative uh, being uh, made with uh, Israeli participation. I hope, and I wish you good luck. I hope it will be uh, fulfilled uh, in the future. You will uh, be entered for this 2% of the successful presentations. Uh, uh, second, my, uh, uh, my remark saying that it's, uh, 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 Professor uh, Lucas, it's much worse. You mentioned that Standard treatment for the uh, palliative patients and elderly patients for the agitation, you said it's benzodiazepines. It is wrong. The standard care is much worse. It, uh, it, it is neuroleptics. So it's uh, major tranquilizers and they are under the severe side effects attack. So the standards for these patients is much worse than with volume and other benzodiazepines. So this is a standard of care now. And the cannabis should be and could be a very good alternative. We just need to have very inter- uh, serious studies comparing, uh, because in uh, our experience in Israel, I, I, was a, I was a participant of the such trial, first trial, uh, seven years ago in our, one of our nursing homes in Kibbutz. Uh, I was a psychiatric there. So we reduced uh, almost all sedatives and uh, and neuroleptics and benzodiazepines from these nursing uh, patients. So we had a uh, first-person experience how it's working. And uh, uh, I I would like to say uh, uh, that we need to have uh, much more better understanding and methodology for such patients. We should know it, and we need to create it because, because, because we have no manual how to treat these patients till now. And even with your experience, with Israel experience, because we are only two countries who has, uh, have uh, enough experience, clinical experience, from the real and real world data. Uh, my, my last uh, remark is uh, for also for uh, uh, Kubu, saying that you explicit that European agencies, European medicinal agencies are waiting for conclusive, conclusive research. 
in order to make some decision uh, about including, including cannabis as a standard treatment. How long we would like to, it will take for us for the conclusive research? You just explicit the data from the, uh, from the antibiotics for, uh, for uh, uh, ulcer, peptic disease. It took three years in order to be fully proved. How long we will, uh, uh, our patients will wait for this conclusive research? We need just to take this paradigm. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, and that's exactly the type of uh, disconnection we are all trapped in. It's not about me. It's about what the experts beyond this auditorium, the ones who uh, are running the various university clinics and which can adopt these uh, new methods faster into the practice, will be satisfied. And then the fact that the cannabis industry is not bringing these data for years already, even such basic data like pharmacokinetics profiles of the given herbal materials, which takes few months, it takes few hundreds, thousand euros max, it's nothing what all these big budgets cannot already have done, and providing the shared responsibility and also proper tools to clinical experts who are legally obliged to providing safe treatment. How they can provide safe treatment if they are not getting basic safety data on the products to be used in clinical setting. And back to your uh, comments on uh, Maccabi Healthcare. Uh, I uh, recall uh, Maccabi Healthcare uh, raising uh, uh, even on government to government request which Czech government already addressed to Israel that as they already integrated all the uh, uh, patient, uh, electronic patient health data, uh, they are able to provide such uh, studies, but they are still not getting the proper data from Ministry of Healthcare, who is assigned in the medical cannabis program, because uh, medical cannabis program in uh, Israel still runs in parallel to distribution of medication. So they have all the information about all the other medications, all the treatments. As you said, the only missing piece of the reliable official information is this info what which patient and what was getting so and and of course I'll, I'll do not want to be like going deeper in that because you know the situation in israel much better than me i just wanted to bring this up that the situation is uh, time to time more complex to get to the reliable data which can be properly analyzed and provide this conclusive evidence which will be accepted also and i'm not speaking about opposers the opposers will be still opposing, but there is always this broad, broader uh, group of those who yet not have opinion. But to convince them, just saying like you have to believe, as we do believe, it slows the uh, process. If there would be just this kind of basic, and by the way, the chief uh, geriatric of uh, Maccabi, I think, summarized it very well on the recent CanX uh, when we were also in similar panel. When, in fact, he was calling back to the industry, and Philip already addresses the, it here also very well, that we know from the practice that the elderly patient, or in palliative care, they will be definitely having different reactions than how the healthy population would have. If there would be even information on healthy population, the clinicians, those enrolled in Pakarkan, they are all committed to do so, to make some estimates and Put their, uh, put their credit into the fact that they'll be still providing safety treatment. But if they are not getting even the basic starting safety data on the pharmacokinetics, so how they can proceed in the practice? And that's, that, that's on us. That's on, on the industry, whether we will accept the fact that there are some basic tools which need to be provided to improve the scaling, or we will not. Sure. And, and, and I, I want to say I completely agree with what Pavel's saying. And, of course, at Tilray we support and we conduct research. But the fact is if 
evidence was all it was needed to end the war on drugs, it would have ended 40 years ago. Because in all of the research that I've ever done as an academic, I've never seen a single study, I've never seen a single study that showed that prohibition improved any of the outcomes we're trying to improve with the war on drugs. It doesn't exist. There's never been a publication or research paper that says, when we strictly prohibit and, and, and uh, incarcerate people for using these substances, we improve public health. It doesn't exist because that's not the outcome. So it's impossible to produce that. So it's important that we go ahead with research, but ultimately this is not just an academic battle. If it was that simple, we would have won it a long time ago because the evidence on cannabis, of course it's growing, we're seeing a resurgence of medical cannabis research, but we knew 30 years ago that it was useful in the treatment of cancer, that it was useful, useful in the treatment of, uh, of nausea associated with chemotherapy. We've known all this for so long. So there's a joint battle that needs to happen. You need to produce the evidence, and you need to almost reproduce the evidence that was produced 30 years ago so that it's contemporary, and the studies are done in, in uh, methodologies that are now recognized, which maybe 30 years ago the methodologies would have been a bit different. But at the same time, this is a political battle, because it's an ide ideological battle. And I can show all the evidence in the world to doctors that's against the use of medical cannabis, and it may not change his mind ultimately. He may still say, it's a plant. It's not a medicine. I don't care about this. It's a plant. So I want to say two things to that. One of the reasons that seniors have been able to turn to medical cannabis in the last five years is that suddenly we have products that look more like medicines. So there's no smoking and vaporization much anymore. People are using oils and tinctures and drops and capsules. And to someone who's older, this still this looks like the medication they take every day. So they're more open to it because of that. But I also want to say why seniors and also pediatric patients are so important because they're the ones who change minds. So that same doctor that may not look at the 30 studies that I put in front of them for chronic pain, if his mother benefits from the use of cannabis from arthritis, that's enough to change his mind, right? So older patients vote. Older patients have political clout that younger patients do not. So it's an important demographic for us to focus on one way or another and to grab you know, some of the attention of because ultimately when older patients talk to their elected officials, they can make a difference. And it's the same thing with pediatric patients, of course. We've seen pediatric patients who use CBD change an entire country's drug policy. We've seen it in the UK, we see it in Australia and New Zealand, and we've seen it in the US as well with Charlotte Figge, where one patient with seizure disorder, you know, and a mother talking to a politician can, can basically make that politician see things differently because it's very hard to look at a mother and say, no, no, we should, have, we should continue to support policies that will kill your child or that may endanger your child. So I think that it's important for us to, to do the research, to do all the academic work that satisfies all the drug development, you know, kind of pr process that goes through to satisfy the medical community. But it's also important to recognize that it's not all about the evidence, ultimately, because the evidence has been on our side. If you do a search of PubMed for marijuana, you have 30,000 papers that show up. If you do a search under cannabis, it's 25,000 papers. This is the most studied natural herb in the history of mankind, and yet we're still fighting. To, we're still fighting with people who every day tell Pavel and I, there simply isn't enough evidence. There's not enough evidence, sorry. I see a question at the back there, so I'm not sure if we're still running the mic, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You're too kind. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I couldn't help to wonder at just all the, the questions on the data, and I saw this mostly question from Mr. Lucas and uh, the survey, and it kept me wondering why is there the, the Canadian pharmacies are not on board, and I was wondering if you could tell me more and if there's any progress in there because I think they can, they can add. You don't need a survey if they can provide you with feedback from their patients. Well, I don't I don't have to explain you, but their their feedback would be so valuable. So. Do you, do you see that change in the upcoming time? Or? Yeah, it, what a great question. So I mentioned earlier that 
in almost all of the countries where Tilray's products are available and where medical cannabis is available, not just Tilray products, it's available through pharmacies, whether that be Czechoslovakia, whether that be Germany or, or some of the other European countries where it's available. In Canada, it's still not, and here's why. We have a long history of medical cannabis in Canada. We were the first countries in the world to put in a medical cannabis program in 2001. And initially, when that program was being put into place, uh, the government had written in that pharmacies would do distribution. And they got an immediate pushback from pharmacists and pharmacists association. And they said, we don't want to be the distributors of medical cannabis. Not because they didn't think it was a medicine, because they had a mental image of who the medical cannabis patient is. And they pictured an 18-year-old guy, you know, with a bong, walking into the pharmacy, asking for more medical cannabis. And so they said, we don't want to do this. And as a result of that, our program has never involved pharmacy-based distribution. Now, a few years ago, pharmacists have realized, through research of mine and research that other people have, have done, that when you use medical cannabis, you use fewer pharmaceuticals. And so those pharmacies have thought, huh, if I'm not going to sell as many opioids or benzodiazepines or non-steroidal uh, pain medications, maybe I should sell the alternative. And what I was able to show, and what we've shown through our research, is that medical cannabis patients are like you and I. They're mostly middle-aged individuals. They've had treatment failures. They're looking for alternatives. They're not degenerates. They're not, you know, medical cannabis. Our thesis at Tilray is medical cannabis is a mainstream medicine used by mainstream people. And when pharmacists realized that, they started wanting to get into the game. And now they are in the game. Every major pharmacy chain in Canada is lobbying the government to try and get pharmacy distribution right now. And in fact, our biggest pharmacy chain in Canada is called Shoppers Drug Mart. has 1,700 pharmacies. They just got a license, like Tilray, a lic like a licensed producer, to be able to distribute cannabis. So they're gonna, they just got their sales license this week. So they're going to make it available online to their patients. And you're actually going to be able to use, they have something called an optimum card to collect points. You're going to be able to get points when you buy medical cannabis through them and use it to buy, you know, to buy your other prescription drugs or Kleenex or whatever else. So it's happening very quickly. And one of my roles at Tilray has been training the senior pharmacists from the major pharmacy chains. Here's where I completely agree with you. In the 20 years of working with medical cannabis, nothing will do more to destigmatize or to normalize medical cannabis than to have it available through pharmacies. I think it's going to improve uh, private payer coverage. I think insurers are going to be more, li more likely to cover it. And I think pharmacists are a great point of access for medical cannabis to identify contraindications and to make sure that it's being used safely. So I can't wait for that to happen. And I, I will predict that by t the end of 2019, we have regulations in place to have medical cannabis available in all Canadian pharmacies, but right now it's just going to start out with Shoppers Drug Mart because they've kind of done an end run. They've gotten a license like Tilray, not to grow cannabis, but to be able to buy bulk cannabis from companies like Tilray and redistribute it. So it is coming, it is coming, but it's, it's sad right now that we're behind the rest of the world in pharmacy-based distribution of cannabis. Thank, thanks for the question. All right, thank you. Well, thank you all so much. I want to thank a uh, big hand for Pavel as well. Thank you all for your time as well.